Starfighter combat is a very prominent concept in Star Wars and the Clone Wars featured their fair share of it. But the Starfighter battles of the Clone Wars were much different from those of other conflicts in how one-sided they tended to be. It's no secret that the Confederacy of Independent Systems had the edge in Starfighter battles, so much so that the brave clone pilots of the Republic Starfighter Corps were almost always on suicide missions. In this video, we're going to be talking about Starfighter combat in the Clone Wars and why it was so heavily weighted against the Republic. Through today's sponsor, YouGov, I've found a pretty easy and fun way to earn cash. Let's be real, it's hard not to be political in 2020 and YouGov lets you earn cash and e-vouchers for sharing your opinion. YouGov is a global research company that wants to know what you think about a whole bunch of topics. It's not just politics and social issues, but also your favorite brands, sports, or celebrities. Playing around with YouGov myself, it's honestly a really fun way to earn some extra cash that I can use for my next meal and for my Disney Plus subscription. So if you're looking for a relaxing way to earn some cash these holidays, smash that link in the description below and start earning your points and getting some awesome rewards. Once again, a big thanks to YouGov for sponsoring today's video. Let's start with an overview of starfighter combat in general. In effect, starfighters functioned as a kind of cavalry, being speedier and more maneuverable units which would branch out from larger forces for the purposes of reconnaissance, skirmishing or direct assaults. In military parlance, these kinds of missions were known as force projection, a means of expanding a unit's offensive capabilities. The starfighters that participate in force projection efforts were grouped into two categories, snub fighters and superiority fighters. Snub fighters were starfighters made for offensive projection. These were the craft that would launch strafing runs against ground targets, carry out bombing runs, or directly attack enemy warships. Superiority fighters, on the other hand, were starfighters that were intended for defensive force projection, which usually meant destroying oncoming snub fighters. Superiority fighters tended to be smaller and in many cases, these craft consisted of little more than a cockpit, some engines and a set of laser cannons. There were two major schools of thought when it came to starfighter combat and during the Clone Wars, each side largely embraced one of them. The Republic followed the more traditional line of thinking, which was that starfighters were best used to quickly and effectively weaken enemy defenses, allowing ground armies or warships to finish the job. As a result, the RSC almost entirely employed snub fighters, with only Jedi craft breaking from that pattern. The Confederacy, on the other hand, subscribed to a newer school of thought, which held that smaller superiority fighters could easily rip through snub fighter waves, weakening the defenses of attacking enemy forces. Neither school was necessarily the correct one, but the Confederacy's tactical approach generally proved more effective due to the nature of the CIS's starfighter forces. Separatist vulture droids and tri-fighters were the epitome of superiority fighter design and the confederacy was able to field vast numbers of them. While the Republic snub fighters were effective enough on their own merits, separatist superiority fighters often proved to be too good and too numerous, leading to many Republic naval defeats. The snub fighter slash superiority fighter dynamic is important to understand because it was essentially the foundation of all the other risks clone pilots faced. Space battles were so deadly for clone pilots because of the pattern that those battles tended to follow. Clone snub fighters would attack separatist forces, swarms of separatist superiority fighters would respond, and the clones would end up facing superior droid fighters on the confederacy's side of the battlefield. With that being the case, it was Loki a miracle that the clones ever managed to win starfighter battles. This was only the start of the Republic starfighter problems however. The Republic used quite a few Starfighter models over the course of the Clone Wars. Some ended up lasting for most of the war, most notably the BTLB Y-Wing Bomber and the ARC-170 Starfighter. Those two were honestly the Republic's saving graces and they carved out their own distinctive niches fairly early in the war. The Y-Wing was the Republic's go-to bomber for virtually the entire war and for good reason. As we discussed in a video earlier this year, the Y-Wing was the perfect bomber for the RSC due to how well it countered the problems the clone pilots had to overcome. The ARC-170 had a similar story, and it settled into its own niche as the Republic's heavy-hitting assault fighter. The Y-Wing and the ARC-170 filled specialized roles, however. Most clone pilots were instead needed in the cockpits of general-purpose starfighters, and the Republic couldn't just settle on one model to fit the bill. 
The role was filled by the V-19 torrent for the rest of the war, but it was gradually phased out and replaced by the Z-95 Headhunter. The Z-95 was replaced in turn by the ETA-2 Actus class interceptor, and then by the Alpha-3 Nimbus class V-Wing. The Republic seemingly just couldn't make up its mind on what model it wanted to be the mainstay for the RSC. That was because all of those fighters were markedly inferior to their separatist counterparts. The Confederacy perfected the Troid Starfighter, taking the concept of superiority fighters to extremes the Republic just wasn't capable of. Vulture droids were the most prominent example of this, as the Confederacy produced them in massive numbers and deployed them by the thousands. The Tri-Fighter went even further in pursuing the inherent advantages of these kinds of craft, while the Techno Union also produced the little-known Mank Vim 814 Light Interceptor for use by organic pilots. All of these craft were exceedingly small, fast, and deadly. They were at most half the size of the average Republic Starfighter, presenting small target profiles that made them harder to hit. This, combined with their ability to fly circles around all but the fastest Republic fighters, made them a challenge for clone pilots to destroy. Additionally, they were all well armed despite their small sizes. Each of them was capable of destroying Republic snub fighters without much of a hassle. Vulture droids and tri fighters had another major advantage as well they were droids. On the ground, organics, especially the Republic's clone troopers, were vastly superior to the droids employed by the Confederacy, as they were more imaginative and skilled. But in space, the droids had the advantage. The top speed of Republic starfighters was limited by how much force organic pilots could endure. Even with inertial dampeners, flying faster than a certain speed would kill an organic pilot. Droids had no such weaknesses. Vulture droids and tri-fighters were equipped with extremely powerful engines, which allowed the craft to fly at speeds that would turn organic pilots into pancakes. Vulture droids in particular were infamous for making extremely sharp turns at breakneck speeds, which allowed them to easily outmaneuver and thus destroy enemy starfighters. Tri-fighters were even faster, with a maximum acceleration of 3,600 g, restaggering 35,280 meters per second squared. Sure, these fighters weren't perfect, neither had shields and their droid brains were limited by nature, but their other capabilities more than made up for it most of the time. It's also worth noting just how good of a superiority fighter the droid tri-fighter actually was. Not only was the Tri-Fighter insanely fast and tiny for a Starfighter, but it was also intelligent and heavily armed. The Tri-Fighter featured a high power laser cannon as its main weapon, as well as a trio of light laser cannons and a rack for missiles. This varied arsenal made the Tri-Fighter a highly deadly opponent in a wide variety of situations. The primary laser cannon was useful for more precise shots intended to disable or destroy enemy craft, while the light laser cannons were spray and prey weapons that could easily trap starfighters in a deadly field of fire. The tri-fighter was also effective against harder targets due to its missiles, which allowed it to act as a snub fighter to a limited degree as well. To make things even worse for clone pilots, tri-fighters were quite clever, much more so than their vulture droid counterparts. On top of these disadvantages, the Republic was always outnumbered in space combat, especially on the starfighter front. The Confederacy had no shortage of starfighters. Their droid craft were mass produced on hundreds of worlds, allowing separatist commanders to deploy them in vast swarms. The average Trade Federation battleship could unleash a swarm of 5,000 vulture droids, while tri fighters were often deployed in the hundreds. To contrast, the Veneta class Star Destroyer had a maximum starfighter carrying capacity of just over 400. The Republic, additionally, started the war with a shortage of clone pilots, a problem that only compounded itself as pilots quickly started getting killed. For most of the war, Republic starfighters were manufactured faster than reinforcements were sent to the RSC from Kamino, leaving loyalist commanders with more fighters than pilots. This got so bad that rank and file clone infantry started being trained to fly starfighters during the outer rim sieges allowing them to double as pilots in a pinch. The Republic's pilot shortage persisted even to the last days of the Clone Wars, and was resolved only after the Battle of Coruscant. Now, the Republic's clones were generally used to being outnumbered. In ground battles, numbers almost always favoured the Confederacy, 
but this advantage often proved to be a moot point. Clone troopers were, across the board, much better than battle droids and on average, clones had a 20 to 1 KD ratio, which is pretty insane. But clones had little to no advantage over droids in space, at least in practice. Sure, a clone pilot would win a one-on-one -on -one dogfight with a Vulture droid 9 times out of 10, but even a veteran clone pilot would struggle against 5 Vulture droids, and most space battles saw Republic starfighters outnumbered 5 to 1 or worse. All told, the odds were stacked quite highly against the clone pilots. They were up against better craft and greater numbers following better tactics, and most of the time their enemies had the defender's advantage too. Any time a clone pilot flew into battle, he was staring death in the face, and much more closely than any of his brothers in other military branches were. Serving in the Republic Starfighter Corps was just an unending string of suicide missions, and those clones knew it well. But despite all these disadvantages, despite the odds being stacked so high against the Republic Starfighter Corps, there were many battles in which the clone pilots pulled through and even won the day. There are three major reasons for this. Firstly, the Republic starfighters like the Y-Wing and ARC-170 were capable of piercing through Separatist fighter screens and fending off enemy craft, as we discussed in the aforementioned earlier video. Secondly, the Republic's snub fighter tactics weren't without merit. Often, Y-Wings would be able to break through Separatist lines and cripple enemy warships, giving the Republic an edge. And lastly, there were the Jedi, whose piloting skills were more than a match for even the best droid models. So that's why naval battles were pretty much suicide for clone pilots, but what do you think? Are you interested in hearing more about the starfighters we mentioned in this video, more in depth? Let us know as usual in the comment section below. And just before you go guys, if you want to listen to the music we used in this video unobstructed, then make sure you check out our Relax Jack music channel, where you can check out that music and use it for your own creative projects too. If you want to join our wider Geetsleys community, check out our main Discord where you can chat to myself and other Star Wars fans, and our Geetsleys Gaming Network where you can play games with other Star Wars fans. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.